here we go. Take one. Take the flag, it's ready. Sixth SOS uh, squadron at uh, Play Coup, and I spent uh, 15 months there, and and uh, three months at Da Nang on special alert up there for SAR, as uh, search and rescue. I believe you were with Ola, weren't you, when you were at yes. uh, mm -hmm. at, uh, at Da Nang, because that was a very unique organization. Yeah. We'll chat a little bit more about that here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But Arnie, okay, my name is Arnie Harmon. I was uh, a 462, a weapons load team, um, and I was stationed at NKP. I got there in June of 68, left in June of 69. I was assigned to the then the 602nd Air Commando Squadron, which in June, in August of 68, became the uh, Special Operations Squadron. So I would have been there the same time as George Merritt, Don Dunaway, uh, Jim Beggarly, um, and a few others, the pilots that are here at the uh, at this uh, event. It's amazing how many guys that are from your era are here today. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, yeah. yep. I uh, I planned it. I'm going to try to get a photo with uh, any pilots who were there that era that I was there together, because it'll help me tell my story l better later at home, and um, and also in the other three squadrons. But uh, like Paul, we had probably at that time we had about twenty. 22 aircraft assigned to each of the three squadrons that were uh, at NKP during that time. All right. Barry? I'm Barry Rowland. I'm also a 462, like these guys, and uh, worked strictly in guns, on the A1s, the main guns and the wing guns. Uh, I was in NKP from June 70 to June 71. However, I had to, uh, it was a bad boy, so they extended me over to Da Nang for another year and uh, before I got to come home. So when you were in Tanang, what, what unit were you uh, I was with the 366 Tech of Fighter Wing and 366 MMS. I worked on F-4s there. Okay. Yeah. But Very the A-1s were across the street, and I'd go over and see visit with all the guys that I knew from NKP. Did you guys, now were you there at the same time? I'm sorry. Was, uh, what year were you there? 69 and 70. Okay, no, you yeah, were, I think we were all yeah. about a month apart or something. Getting them a couple months apart. You were about a year or two later, weren't you? Uh, I was in... Um, it probably got to Da Nang about um, last part of April or first of May when I got there, and we spent three months in a row there. Okay. So what this is is just an interview, and I would love to know about your personal experiences working with the aircraft, working with the guys. Were there any points when your pilot took off, did you worry, is he coming home? Because you know, I know during the later part of the, the war, it got really, really hot, and there was a lot going on, but... What was it like on the ground for for you guys? And uh, if we could just go with that, any funny story, anything that you want to talk about, let's let's talk about that. Wait, Barry, weren't you telling me that uh, when you graduated high school and you signed up, they sent you to a secret air base? Was, was yeah. it, we were just let's start with that. Well, if we could. yeah, I, I was in college, an Army ROTC, and my draft number wasn't that good, and neither were my grades. So, uh, <laughs> I uh, ROTC class, I. I made somebody mad, you know, the colonel or whoever who was overseeing us, so uh, I said, the hell with this. I'm, if I'm going to play this, I'm going to play it for real. So my friend drove me to the recruiting office in Pittsburgh, Kansas. I enlisted in the Air Force in my Army ROTC uniform. And shortly after I, you know, I, they let me finish the semester, and I went uh, uh, 
did my basic, went to Lowry and, and then McConnell Air Force Base and uh, found out that 96310, whatever it was, and the guy, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's terrible. I'm sure we all heard the same story, you know, secret <laughs> base here. And, you know, and uh, I'd never heard of the place. And only a couple other guys says, oh, yeah, you, 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 you know, you've got to wear a flak jacket all the time and a helmet and stuff. And I'm like, Gee, how come we haven't heard about this, you know? Then nobody's ever said anything about it. I go to NKP and get off the C-130, and you look out, and, and I think Arnie will tell you the same thing. Where in the hell am I? I mean, this is World War II. <laughs> there wasn't a jet engine on that plane. Well, turbos, but for the helicopters and the uh, thing. And uh, PSP, taxiway, they had the runway concrete, I think, when I got there. And uh, But they had to use that taxiway a couple times to land when the runway got repairs. And the noise was unbelievable. So uh, here we are with these airplanes we'd, I'd never heard of before. But I was trained in guns, so they put me in the gun shop. and. Uh, life ever after, you know, 12 hour days, most of the time it was six or seven days a week and SARS came up, we were really busy because there were limited number of airplanes and guns, so we always had to have guns, fresh guns for the pilots. How long would it take you to swap out a gun if somebody came back from a mission or if something was wrong? How, how long would it take you to? Five minutes. Really? Yeah. The inboards were real easy, you fold the wings yeah. up, slide them right out. With the, Outboards was a different story. You could still do it real quick, but in a, in the monsoon season, you could also end up sliding off the wing and landing <laughs> on the PSB and move faster than the gun did before it hit you. That happened to me twice, and it's those those planes were just terrible to work on in rain. Yep. I don't think people understand when you're talking the A1 Sky Raider. I've heard that it would run out of oil before it ran out of gas because it just just had all those cylinders and it had oil everywhere on it and. Yeah. It, that's iconic of, the, of that aircraft, correct? correct. So that's yeah. where you would be, and, and the rain would yeah. hit that, it would be slick. And yeah. There was also a, a part of the airplane called the hell hole above the center fuel line tank that was, you, did you ever get in it? It was like 18 by 18 inches, and a lot of the hydraulics and electrical Fluid. gear was up there, and you had to take this thing out. You could not go in there. If you had a white t-shirt on, it wasn't, it wasn't white when you came out, it was well colored. Oh my goodness. And then you usually had safety wire cuts all over your arms and uh, and crew chiefs, we made them, the crew chief had to open them and close them because it was a red X of it when that thing was gone. But uh, Speaking of yeah. the hell hole, did you guys, you met Rich Hall? No, not no, really. You have, you have got to find him. He's wearing the blue shirt. He's from Oklahoma. And you say, I, I need to know the story about the hell hole. Uh -huh. One of his guys took off, and I guess the door was left off. Oh, crap. And the light was on on a night mission, and the guy couldn't figure out why he was getting hosed. I mean, he was just getting <laughs> oh. shot up terrible. <laughs> and his, his wingman comes under, he's like, hey, man, I figured out what's going on. you got a light on. <laughs> so you, need to, you need to run into Rich Hall and ask him that story. So. I didn't know you could fly without it. <laughs> no, I didn't either, not without that. Uh, I know you didn't without a gun door. Yeah, uh, I mean, It would fly, happened. but it was really... <laughs> Yeah, they had to compensate yeah. for it. Compensate for it, yeah. So, um, so I, after I graduated from high school, I, I worked a year just goofing off, <coughs> met my future wife, and I uh, um, enlisted in April of, let's see, that would have been 67, but a delayed enlistment to uh, October of 71. Went in on the buddy plan got out of basic and immediately got orders to, uh, um, and the reason I enlisted in the Air Force is I uh, knew the draft was coming up the following January or February it started. Didn't know what my number was, but I didn't want to take a chance. Um, and I'd had some buddies that uh, had already gone. Matter of fact, one of our high school buddies was already uh, KIA. And I said, I don't want that to be me. I want to be I want to go in the Air Force, and the recruiter said, hey, uh, we'll get you an electronics. You scored high on the electronics portion or the math portion, so you can name, pretty much name your field in getting into electronics. I thought, great. And I said, what kind of electronics? So, microwave technology and stuff. I said, of course, 67, you don't know what microwave technology is, and I thought, that sounds pretty cool. That's maybe a job I could use uh, on the outside. So enlisted, and... Uh, get orders to go to Lowry for weapons and mechanic training. I'm like, that's not electronics. What, you know, what, the, <laughs> what the heck's going on here? So I went to the, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the our drill sergeant. I said, hey, I'm supposed to be electronics. He said, son, 
you don't have a choice. You're going, <laughs> you're going to Lowry to weapons school. You know, does in a Texas draw you had. Mm. So <clears throat> went to Lowry, get in there in, no, uh, in November, and uh, it was night out. It was colder than crap, marching across the um, flight line area to get to our barracks and started uh, weapons school and uh, finished that up. And um, I, my orders were delayed for a while after uh, weapons school. And I was uh, going to go to uh, NACOM Phenomena. Back then, I pronounced it Nacken Famine. Nack and, famine. and I didn't know how to even say it. And so I'm taking the orders around to a couple of the four and five and six stripers and saying, where is this? Because nobody could tell me. And, they, and finally, the one guy, a, a tech sergeant, said, oh, that's a secret base. Um, but I think it's in uh, in in Vietnam. And I said, no, the orders say in Thailand. And um, he said, oh, I, I don't know. I just, I just know that it's a secret base. So... Finally, uh, June rolls around, get the flight, get over there, get into Bangkok, and the first impression that I had him that still is with me today as if I had opened that door right there is when they open that, that flight door to let the stairs down for you to get off the plane, and you, of course you had to stay in your seat for a while, um, was this overcoming humidity and the smell. And I'm like... <laughs> This smells like toe jam. What the <laughs> heck is this? I'm like, I can't, I cannot believe what, something's got to be wrong here. Of course, you could become accustomed to that over days and months and and a, a year's duty. And then uh, put us up in a hotel for a night. And the next day, get a fight out of Don Mong on a C-130. And says, you're going to be on a Klong hopper. And I said, well, what's a Klong hopper? To see what C-130 sitting out there. And I said, why do they call it a Klong hopper? You'll see. So it just went base to base to base, and I think NKP must have been the last of the line before he got off because it was nighttime by the time we got there. Get off the base, and I'm looking around. They've got all these light alls up, and I'm looking for the F-100s and the F-4s and the 105s, <laughs> and and I'm like, where where's the jet aircraft and and where's the concrete? You know, this is all metal run metal PSP stuff, or, or, and I didn't know what it was at the time. So uh, asking these questions, they put you up. And, of course, you, uh, the 602nd was just in the process of moving from Udorn to NKP uh, during that month. And we were there at the north end of the flight line at a huge Army tent that was put up. And that was our weapon shop, temporary weapon shop. We were probably in there two to three months, something like that. And eventually they cobbled together a some plywood here and plywood there and they built a little weapon shop more close to the uh, squadron location but when i got there there were there were a couple t-28s and um, uh, some of the a1s and the spooky gunships and and i asked the guys you know when did they bring the jets in oh this is not a jet base you know they can't land jets here except on emergency landing so um so that was the first introduction to NKP and getting off that plane, I'm like, the one guy said, we truly are at the end of the earth. We're truly at the end of the world. It's like, <laughs> holy crap, this is just carved out of nothing here. And it was, it was an amazing experience to say the least. I think everything that I've read from the pilots that were at Udor that got shipped over to NKP when they started. Oh, they had to be really disappointed. Oh, they were. They were like, oh. we were out on the town. Yep. We were having this great thing. And then we're in the middle of nowhere, and it's mud and sticks and oh. bugs and oh. PSP runways. Oh, and when the monsoons came, mm -hmm. I don't remember the months they came anymore, but uh, there were these huge rice bugs <laughs> that... that came out of the sky. I don't know where they came from, but we, you know, we were under the impression it was raining rice bugs. And they would, but the ties would give you five baht, which was a quarter back then, or maybe it was one Nick, baht. Nickel. Yeah. And that was one baht. Yeah. Okay. To, you know, if you captured the, uh, if you caught any of those, you sold them to the ties. They would give, give you a, a nickel, or, uh, one baht back then, which was a lot of money. And uh, saw the one tie guy, um, in the military uniform, 
bite the head off, spit the head out, and suck out the insides. And I'm like, are you serious? That's what you people do? So at any rate, it was a interesting, interesting experience. <laughs> Did you have any conversations with your recruiter that said you were hanging for electronics? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I did finally get home, he was already shipped out someplace else because I was going back to find him. And uh, mm -hmm. but interesting that you should mention that. So for four six two guys in that era, you could make minimum time and grade if you passed your three level and five level tests. And when I, once I understood what three level and five level meant, it meant more money, mm -hmm. and getting paid 102 bucks a month uh, initially, and maybe what did we make? Uh, well, I, to, begin we, hmm? to, to begin with, to begin with, with 90, 96, 96, but then we got raised up to 102 when we got yeah. one strike. Well, you, you must got more money. Yeah, than I, 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 I got more <laughs> both of them. Yeah, I got 140. <laughs> okay, but at any rate, it was I don't, for some reason 102 sticks in my head. But I knew that if I passed those tests and made my minimum time and grade, um, that I would get more money. So that was the only thing that was motivating me. It wasn't to advance a career, because I didn't see a career loading <laughs> bombs on planes the rest of my life. And I, and I knew that coming out of the Air Force, uh, Pan Am wasn't uh, hiring mm -hmm. bomb loaders, and United wasn't hiring bomb loaders, so that wasn't going to fly. So when um, I made E5 at 6... Uh, E5 at uh, three and a half years, and um, they started talking to you about re-enlisting, and I uh, um, said, well, can I get cross-trained into electronics like I wanted to? And they said, uh, sure, we can do that. Uh, we'll guarantee that to you. And I, so then my second question, and he said, at the same time, we're gonna go, we've, we've already got orders for you to go to uh, Germany. I don't remember the air base anymore, but you're going to go to Germany for three years. You've got a three-year assignment there. I said, well, then I... And I was trying to be a, not a smart aleck, but I wanted to ask questions before I signed. And I said, so as a cross-trained into this other field, electronics field, would I ever have to load bombs again? Well, you may. I said, what do you mean you may? Well, you're going to retain your 462 as a secondary AFSC code. And I said, uh, so you can call me into that, that career field anytime you want. Uh, yeah, we can, uh, but they won't do that to you. And I said, uh, that's what my recruiter said to me <laughs> initially, so uh, I, I understand where you're coming from. And then I said, uh, so if you send me to Germany for three years and my family, and I had uh, two kids at the time, <clears throat> I said, um, you're going to pay the whole airfare to have them come. Yep, uh, they'll move everything over there. You know, some nice on-base quarters. I said, uh, that's that sounds really good. So when I get there... Is there a chance that you might, and I'm in this new career field, is there a chance that you might go ahead and send me TDY back to Southeast Asia, loading bombs on aircraft again? Well, there, that could happen, but it's not likely to happen. I said, that's what my recruiter said also, so uh, no thanks. So from a realistic standpoint, I was, uh, I was committed to being a four-year guy and done and out. <laughs> That's very Can, good. I, I, I would have a hard time trusting that. <laughs> yeah, this didn't work really well. I, I thought I was going somewhere else. Yeah. I want to add a little bit to what sure. Arnie said yeah. about going through the promise and the reenlisting here. When I finished up at NKP, they were sending back guys their second time, four-year guys. Yeah. And, I, and they said, your weapons, you're going to be back here. I put in for Germany. I put in for... White Plains, New York, for some reason, because I'd never been to New York, and I got Da Nang. <laughs> and I didn't get to go home. They needed me Immediately. Right, right then. So I got a C-130 directly to Da Nang. I show up at Da Nang. Who are you? I said, so I'm supposed to be here. I says, what do you do? I says, well, I worked in the gun shop. Good enough. There's a gun shop down there. <laughs> yeah, that's where you're That was my orientation to, to Da Nang. Oh, and, wow. and, and, and the no... What he was talking about it was so true because I started seeing guys coming back that I knew. And I finished my year up here, and I went to Nellis, and I was there for two months. September 20th, TDY, guess what? Third trip. <laughs> I went to Tockley this time, worked on F-11s. Okay, well, so. we, as a 462, you knew you were going you, you you to you go back. And, and other guys are telling you you're going to go back, too. So, so. what is a 462? Could you tell me what that is? That's the designation of what you're... That's AFSC. AFSC. It's the same as in the Army MOS. Yeah. I got you. All right. Yeah. 
So it, um, go ahead, Paul. It's called weapons loading. Okay. Weapons Maybe mechanic. The, mm -hmm. yep. Weapons yep. mechanic. Munitions and weapons, whatever you want. Skilled yep. labor, and I'd like to have you back. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Your skilled labor, and uh, we know you can put bombs on planes and <laughs> and, and kill anybody. And you yeah. and you <laughs> have to kill anybody. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, Paul, can you tell me a little bit about your experience? Well. To start with, I wasn't going to. I was going to go in the Air Force with one of my buddies from high school, and we did the testing, and like these guys had, and and uh, I scored well, but uh, my buddy decided that he was going to put it off a little longer. In the meantime, I got this nice letter from a very special person in the Pentagon <laughs> that said they'd like to see me, <laughs> and, and so, uh, and they even sent me for a medical. You know, no expense to me. And so they sent me up to uh, Ashland, Kentucky, and they run me through a medical that I believe anybody that wasn't in a wheelchair could have passed it. Yep. And it was drafting people like crazy. And uh, so after two weeks, I called my recruiter, or not recruiter, the draft board, and asked them how many of the 20 that went up on my bus load were, had been drafted. Eight had already been drafted. I said... Okay. Next morning, I called the recruiter and I said, "How quick can you get me out of town?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it so, was plenty of motivation. So the next day uh, after that, I was on my way to um, San Antonio, Texas. Now, once you were drafted, they put you wherever they wanted you. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you had Perfect. no options. Yeah, generally. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I didn't feel like I wanted to walk swamps or go no. through the jungle. You know, uh, I'm I was a coward. I mean, I was a good hunter, but I didn't want to hunt like that. <laughs> yeah. And. Yeah. Um, so uh, at tech school, uh, uh, that was fine. Uh, only thing it was, it was very cold at uh, Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was waiting. I had to have my clearance before I could be sent to a, another base after the tech school was done. And uh, so I was there an extra two weeks doing nothing but orderly work, you know. And um, so they sent me to... Uh, K.I. Sawyer in northern Michigan, which is even colder. <laughs> and so uh, I'm not a person that likes cold that well. And uh, so I was freezing out up there. I was there almost a year. And we had some people rotating in from Vietnam uh, coming into my squadron at the uh, Air, Air Defense Command up there. And uh, so I got to thinking... With my career field, I ain't got any options. They're going to send me one time or another. And uh, so I decided to volunteer. I volunteered, uh, but I went to the first sergeant asking, you know, is there any place I could go that I could stipulate where I want to go? And he said, well, they tell me if you get pick out two bases, you'll get one of the two bases. And I looked at the map that they had, and the biggest bases were Cameron Bay and Da Nang. And I thought, sounds good to me. There'd be a lot of people there. You know? So I figured safety in numbers. So <laughs> next thing I knew, I had orders for Herbert Field. And the first day down there, I looked around, and like these guys said, where's the Jets? You know, <laughs> There was no Jets, and, and I didn't know what I was being assigned to. And um, so... Two days later, I was put into a class for the A-1 Sky Raider, and uh, that was a beast of a plane, uh, and I, a single engine, and I thought, can it really do that much, you know? And uh, the more we started studying the weaponry that that could carry, it could carry anything up to a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was impressed with that idea, because I didn't think they was going to come back if they used it. And... Uh, so I, uh, the mornings we were doing studies on just the one type of weapon at a time, the whole morning, that one weapon. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning would be another weapon. But in the afternoon, they were, they were sending us to medical training to where we had to learn how to do set a broken arm, a uh, broken uh, leg, or at least keep it uh, stable, uh, had to... Uh, pretend we had gunshot wounds and how to stop uh, sucking wounds, uh, things like that. And the more I thought about it, uh, 
where are they putting me? <laughs> you know, where am I going to be going? And what am I going to be doing? And then we was learning how to use the M16, how to field strip them, how to clean them, how to put them back together quickly. And I thought, this ain't looking good, Paul. <laughs> so, and uh, so I still didn't know at Christmas time, I was able to go home for a few days for Christmas. And then they sent me to England Air Force Base in Louisiana. And uh, we were putting, the squadron was starting to come together and uh, more people were coming in and our planes they were getting some of them out of the boneyard and some of them somewhere else I don't know where they was coming from but some of them we had to peel this plastic like stuff off of the under part of the wings especially to where we was we had to reinstall the pylons that the bombs were going to hang on on there and those pylons came in, in uh, skids uh, with big all piling the skids, we had to take them by the numbers and sort them out mm. and see which ones went where and find what bolts was going to go in there. And then we had to uh, had to put practice bombs, the 25-pound bombs on them, and uh, hang them on each pylon. And they would take that plane out and fly it a few times and drop the bombs and see whether they was going to come off or not. And uh, so then we had to go out and pick up the bombs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but but it was fun to go out to the bomb range and watch them come in and, and try to uh, try to hit target with them things, because these pilots didn't know how to fly them either. They were coming in, they were coming in out of jets and other things, uh, and they didn't, they weren't sure how to do it. They just had the basics down. The one thing I've heard from any pilot that was a jet pilot that wound up in a sky rigger was, as soon as they got in, the torque of that engine was unbelievable and they yeah. said my right leg is now longer than my left leg just <laughs> from trying to you know keep the torque together on the thing when you took off and uh, yeah and they were talking about that same thing you know a lot of the jet yes. pilots had never touched the rudder mm -hmm. pedals and then they said oh that made me a much better pilot when i got the feel yeah. for all of that mm -hmm. yeah i watched a plane get hit with a crosswind uh, i was on the arming crew at the end of the runway and it happened to be colonel birdsong and uh, he was going down the runway, and he had an observer or somebody in the, front the seat with him on the other side. And uh, it just kind of kicked the tail over quite a bit. And that plane, they overcorrected or something, and ended up going down the medium in the grass and bounced up in front of the tower out there and was able to come to the stop. The guy on the right seat hopped out of the plane. <laughs> uh, I think he had an emergency call somewhere. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, the birds, Colonel Birdsall turned the plane around, come back down, looked at us, never said anything or waved or anything, just went out on the runway. I think he forgot to lock the tail wheel down. I think it's what he, that happened. And he took off, never had any complaint after that but hmm. but talking about rice bugs uh, we had um, uh, MJ1 bomb lift machines and it took two machines to load a plane one had a hook on it a boom, a boom mm -hmm. that would pick them up with a chain off the wagon and bring it over to the MJ1 that I would drive and it had a we had to have a box homemade box uh, to in order to fit the angle of the wing and um, so he put the, on my box, and I'd drive it under the plane and lift it up to about an inch or two from the um, pylon itself. And then the crew chief would bring it on up with the hand controls and lock it on. And uh, so that's the way things went like that. With, and uh, we loaded uh, rockets, miniguns, 20 millimeter guns. Um, 500 pound, pound bombs, 750 pound bombs. 250s? Uh, very rare. Okay. But once in a while, it was 250s, but then it would be several of them together. Um, then they had, uh, at one point, we were using 2,000 pound bomb on the center line. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I got a picture of that. I, I put it on the internet there. Is that the one that had the big daisy cutter on it? It's just yeah. this massive. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And the daisy cutter was a 30 inch uh, tube, and the fuse was out on, and it was loaded with, high, with uh, powder. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Can you explain to the folks what the daisy cutter would do? Because I'm sure people have seen it, but it's that long tube. Uh, okay. Why was it there? All right. So if you take it 30 inches off the ground, that's where the bomb was going to go. And it was going to blow more out than up. And that way you'd cut down trees, uh, you could blow out people, you know, you know, it could do a lot of damage or try tanks, trucks, uh, whatever. Uh, if it hits the, if a bomb hits the ground, all the way down to the ground, without a daisy uh, cutter, then you're going to have a 45 degree angle mm -hmm. all the way around that bomb, and that's all you're going to have mm -hmm. other than the concussion. So you do more damage with a daisy bug uh, cutter. But, um, they had a fuse on the very end. All the yeah. hard bombs had a fuse, and they were um, oh, probably about this long, um, and it screwed into the nose of the bomber and the nose of the daisy cutter, and it had a propeller on the front. Right. Um, and there were dials in the front, and your, your tech order for the day, or that bomb load, told you how to set the settings, and the settings would... Uh, set the bomb off or start the chain of reaction that would set the bomb off um, at either a certain altitude or after so many revolutions of this uh, thing after it broke away from the aircraft. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and also inside the neck of the, um, of the uh, fuse, there was a... Oh, a little pellet thing we yeah, put just in. Yeah, about that big, about the size of a quarter. Right? Yeah, but it's inserted, mm -hmm. you know, maybe about two inches or an inch long or something like that. Yeah. Or maybe half an inch long. Yeah. But it inserted, and that was a, del a, a delay mechanism. Right. And they went from a quarter of a second, I think I remember, up to three quarters of a second. But the, you never figured that out. It was all on the mm -hmm. tech order to mm -hmm. how to set that for the settings. What would happen if there was a... Uh, either a prairie fire mission or a SAR where you're loading planes constantly. I mean, that had to be very daunting because I can't imagine tech orders being, I mean, when, when they were in contact, how did you keep up with that? I well, mean, you, did, you didn't, uh, the MJ-1, which was the bomb loading device, we eventually, when you're turning aircraft and trying to turn it in 20 minutes, that got put away, but again, you weren't on those SARS. You weren't loaded, generally loading hard bombs. Mm -hmm. um, CBUs. You, you were loading the tubular CBUs, rocket pods, Smoke. Mm -hmm. um, the 25 pound or whatever it was, 50 pound or 100 pound white phosphorus green um, bombs. So those you hand loaded. Anything that was 250 pounds or less, we picked up and muscled it up into the plane, and the guy locked it in. Uh, so frag bombs. Uh, we did the same way. All the 20 pounds? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. The, well, the ones that had the six frag bombs, and they were and triangular. And a cluster. And cluster bombs, yep. Mm -hmm. So we would, uh, all those we would uh, hand load. Uh, so typically on a SAR mission, those are the types of weapons that they would use. And there would be a guy up on the top uh, putting the munitions in the, the, a new can of munitions in each of the guns, which was 200 rounds, if I remember right, 180 to 200 rounds and torquing that munition in until it got to the end of the runway. Um, but if, as two guys would lift it up in, the crew chief would lock the uh, pylon in and put the safety pin in, and you get to the next station, go over to the trailer, grab that munition. You knew which munitions went on certain stations, and for the most part, the CBUs went in the outboard stations. Then there'd be a, maybe uh, the smaller rocket pod, uh, seven-tubed one, and then maybe a white phosphorus bomb, and then a the 19 in 19 tube. Um, I can't remember the technical names for those uh, munitions any longer. LAU. Yeah, I knew it was an LAU, but I couldn't remember if it was a three and a 59 or whatever it was. But I think the three was a seven tube. Oh, okay, and the 59 yeah. might have been the nine or 19 was. tube. I don't remember this that one. But. While you're returning this aircraft, yep. Would the pilot stand there? How would he get the communication of? this is what's on your rack, this is your load when you're heading out. Because I know there was a very complicated switching mechanism inside, so they would have to know what was on the stations. Would you pass them something, uh, a sheet, or was it... No, I think I think yeah. their orders already... Frag when they, yeah. yeah, they already had a frag order okay. that they, came from when they went to their pre-flight briefing that they knew what weapons, and these guys knew the weapons 
Well, better than the weapons guys, yeah. really, right. and knew yeah. their capabilities and what have you. And they had clips that they put on their uh, on yeah. trousers, yeah. and on that they had notepads, and I'm sure that they carried the card that had what, what, what was, was on, on what yeah. station. Yeah. Jim George just sent me a bunch of stuff, a box full of things for one of the local museums, and as I was going through, I did, I saw a few of those cards, oh, okay. and I was like, oh, this is what, you know, that, that, all right, I see where that is. Because yeah. so, when they're in a cockpit, they can't see generally right. that station to know what's on that particular yeah, well, station. Well, knowing that on the side of the airplane, you remember the place where it says the, armament? The black and you're yeah. supposed to ride yeah. it? Supposed nobody to, ever did. Nobody, no. how can you? <laughs> you didn't have time to. <laughs> no, you didn't. No. No, we were, so you, tell them about when uh, the frag changed. After you just loaded a plane, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. download it all and reload it with reload something, it else. something else. Here comes a trailer. You know, the, you've just finished the load. Here comes a trailer pulling up in from the bomb dump. Well, we've already got this one. Lo nope, they're changing the frag order. So you had to take all the stuff off that you just loaded, safe it all, um, defuse it all, and throw it on the trailer and get the stuff off the other trailer. Because something changed that mm -hmm. caused the mission to change mm -hmm. that required different uh, weapons. And so it, was, it wasn't It was frequent that that happened, but it, it, it did, did happen. It did happen once yeah. in a while. I've yeah. been listening to a lot of the SAR audios, and you know there'll be somebody in a Kingbird saying, all right, what do you need now? Mm -hmm. And whoever Sandy One is, is going, I need NAPE. Mm -hmm. And I need, you know, and, and mm -hmm. they're calling back. And then you could hear this chain going through the audio to where it's got to go, and then it would come all the way back through like three or four people. Nope, don't have any of that. And you're like, no, 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 we've got to have this. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. The communication is what I'm always amazed by. You were, what, probably 100, 200 miles away from where these guys were at any given point. They'd bring the aircraft back, mm -hmm. and then you'd be constantly, or you'd be loading whatever you could so the next group could go. Well, in, in my case, we were only about... Um, and then KP, you're right about that. But about yeah. 40 yeah. miles from the border. So yeah, yeah. Denang was much closer. Yeah. Well, I was at Play Coup. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Play, Play Coup would have been about 40 miles uh, from the DMZ. To the, uh, no, to the um, La Ocean border. Yeah. Yeah, there were some close times at NKP that the guys took off. Yeah. You hear them coming back. But, oh, they must have boarded anything. Nope. <laughs> nope, they dropped <laughs> it. Or just on the other side oh, of the river. Yep, that wow. happened yeah. occasionally. Yeah. There were... Yeah. Um, you know, you could go down, well, we worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, right. and I know my first 73 days, because uh, I kept a chart on the wall, was without a day off, um, and eventually got a day off, and you went downtown just to kind of wander into town and see, okay, what's this really like? And you get to the Mekong River, and you look across the river at the karsts and the, mm -hmm. the uh, mountains, and like, what the heck is this? I mean, you could see it. Above mm -hmm. the chow hall on the uh, oh, hill, yeah, yeah. you could see the mountains. And, and at night, when um, I don't remember if it was a linebacker was going on the B-52s, but you could see some flashes off in yeah. the I off in the seen distance. Them often, yeah. Yep, see the flashes off in the distance at nighttime, and you could hear the boom, 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 yeah. boom. Yeah. But if it, people have never seen Thailand and, and Vietnam. That Mekong River is it. It is a dividing line. It is. And it is such a stark contrast because you see. I look at pictures today, and there's people touring NKP and the Compton, and it's oh, this totally. beautiful yeah. area. Oh. And you look across, and it's just a wall of ugly that it you're is. going into. It look. You know, when I first saw it. I thought, King Kong lives there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> King Kong exactly. lives there. Exactly. You know, that's yeah. exactly yeah. the first thought that came to yeah. my mind when I saw the yeah. river and saw the Karst Mountains over yeah. there. So yeah. that's where they got to film King Kong. Yeah. Now, whether they did or not, I don't know, but... <laughs> so, it's rough. So, oh, it's very so, rough. After Arnie left, and we modernized downtown, they had Monty's <laughs> Ice Cream Parlor on the Mekong River. Yeah. And we'd sit there and have beer and ice cream and see the same thing going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul, earlier we had talked about uh, a friend of ours who's a pilot, and uh, it was Don Deneen. Yeah. And he was discussing how many pounds of ordnance. He, he figured out how many pounds of ordnance were on just his aircraft. Can you go into that? Because you, you worked with him a little bit. Yeah. Or... Uh, yeah, he was he sent me a, a copy of it, in fact. And uh, it was over a million pounds that he was able to calculate that was on his plane at one time. I mean, not one time, but I mean over the period of the year. The mm -hmm. period of a year that he was there. And he delivered those, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's so, a, that was only one plane. And uh, if you figure that we had 
21 or 22 planes or so. Um, we always had some in the hangar that were needing engine repairs or something. So you kind of brings your number down close to 15 planes at a time that were flyable. And uh, so those 15 planes got used unless they were broke down uh, and had to have some extra maintenance done to them. But a lot of times, oil and gas put them back up. Yeah. Yeah. One thing in retrospect now that, you know, the pilots were smart enough, some of them were smart enough to maintain logs and yeah. knew that this as a historical event. But as a 19 year old snot nosed kid coming <laughs> right out of tech school and a yeah. one striper showing up at, a, at the end of the earth, your last thing is, I want to just go home alive, you know. And of course, in Thailand, there just weren't any losses of ground personnel generally, unless yeah. it was something silly. Um, but um, you didn't think to create a log, and I just so wish I'd have done mm -hmm. that to write down the tail numbers and what the load was yeah. and um, what that <laughs> night or that day experience was. I was there when uh, uh, Colonel, our squadron commander, Colonel Jones, brought his smoking cockpit plane back, saw it land, and where it had come down that, you know, what had happened and he was uh, going to have to be evacuated and you saw at the end of the runway the activity that occurred in the chopper that flew him over to our little dispensary and then he got airlifted out. And then also when Wayne Warner um, um, had his incident at the north end of the, no, south end of the runway, um, he wrote the book uh, One Trip Too Many or One Trip Too Far or something like that. Um, and it was, um, we're sitting in the weapons shop that day, and you could, I loved how the Sky Raider sound had taken off. I mean, it was just that guttural, uh, extremely loud exhaust. But you could tell from the RPMs, and he's about the middle of the runway, and he's lifting off. You could tell the engine change and the pitch change. And as they've got further away, of course, that droned out. And this day that Wayne was uh, flying, um, and uh, he, uh, his plane was taken off. We're in the, in the shop relaxing in between loads for a couple of minutes, getting out of the heat of the sun, and uh, hear the engine taken off, and it uh, all of a sudden, somewhere mid-takeoff, the roll and then the takeoff, the engine quit, and that, there was all of a sudden just complete silence, just like that, and we all jumped up, I mean, what the heck? We ran out, and just in time to see him uh, uh, nose in at the end of the runway and the uh, ensuing fireball from the from the um, from the uh, fuel tanks that uh, detonated, and you could see him. Of course, this is I don't know, maybe what is it? Probably half a mile away, but you could see an image upside down outside the cockpit. You're all in horror. And seeing the flames and then all of a sudden that jolly green that was on standby that was just about to lift off lifted off came over banked at a i don't know 30 degrees or 45 degrees to fan the flames around while two guys and i don't remember their names i remember reading them in the book but came over cut him out and drug him uh, off to uh, a safe distance he was hung up by his harness as he was, he trying was. To get out. yep and yep he was he trying to get out up. He was, and I don't know whether he really recalled all that or it's just uh, people accounted to him, but it was just like a movie uh, uh, playing out right before your very eyes, and the image is still there. I could, I could see it right now as I'm telling you, relating this story to you. And, of course, thankfully, he was airlifted. Uh, uh, they took him over, and I just don't remember what happened to him afterwards, but... Uh, we said, stood there and watched the rounds cook off, and the and, and I I don't remember what kind of load was even on that plane any longer, um, but the rounds cooked off, and it probably at first you could see the fire trucks all there trying to douse the flames, and then all of a sudden the rounds started cooking off pretty good, and they backed completely away and just let it uh, pretty much uh, burn up. And I think from a distance they might have kept a hose on it or something, but uh, memory serves me right. It was several hours before it finished cooking off. Um, but it was uh, one of several incidents on the field um, 
there was a, a night mission and an A-26. I wasn't mm -hmm. on the, that um, two guys lost their lives on the other end of the runway, which would have been the north end. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, the only reason I realized that um, the next day I had end of, end of runway duty and uh, they were, maybe it was a day or two after that, they were, had the big cranes out there lifting the parts away to uh, try and salvage what they could. Um, I had some photos of that. So it was, um, there were a few incidents that happened on base. Needless to say, uh, as a weapons troop, we had a couple incidents in, in my particular weapons team so they had these flare pods. The first incident. You had to bring that up, huh? I did. <laughs> so they had these uh, flare pods for when they sometimes when they fly night missions, they were a big tube of four individual tubes inside it, um, and they had these I think Mark Twenty Five canister flares that went nose to nose inside, and you'd slide the one end, and on the back end was a a little hinge thing that had a firing pin in it that when the, when the um, pilot wanted to discharge those two flares, he would trigger it and it would fire that pin and uh, the air would force the uh, um, flares out the tube. And these Mark 24 silver canister flares, which were about that big around, about that long, if I remember right, um, and they had timing mechanisms in the, in the nose of each of them, and they had these silver rope lanyards, and you'd tie them with a ring together. Um, so the one time they came back with the, uh, with the, the load, and we had to download the stuff, and you had to safe them. So the way they downloaded these uh, flare pods was there's a long pole it may have been an old fuse extender, I don't remember anymore, but the long metal pole that we pushed the uh, out, pushed the flares out the back end after we took the pin out. And uh, there were two guys on the other end, one to catch the current, the, the first one, cradle in his arms, and slowly uh, pull, push the other one out. And uh, the, uh, they'd have to disconnect the lanyards and there was a way to turn the dials to a safe position so they wouldn't be at it, um, wouldn't be detonated. Well, lo and behold, I'm uh, I'm on the pushing end with the rod, and the crew chief back there, and uh, two other guys um, that are cradling these, and lo and behold, the one uh, somehow detonated, and I all I heard was this big. And all of a sudden, just this brilliant light, and and the one guy that was cradling dropped the other flare, and he's screaming like crazy, and he's running through the clong to go up to the weapon shop and up the hill. So I'm chasing him. I'm thinking he probably got the flare in his gut or something. You know, something happened to him because he's not. He's screaming like a, like he's really injured. Um, and. Lo and behold, it it, it it had hit his knee, and he ended up. I think he. They discharged him or something. He was gone not long after that uh, on medical or something. But um, when the flare ignited, it was on the ground and burning. And there was a trailer of uh, napalm that it had landed right next to. And our tech sergeant, line sergeant, um, um, an African-American guy, I think his name was Sergeant Black, um, had the wherewithal to take the truck, hook up to that trailer, and haul those napalm away that were somebody described as smoking or sm sweating. And if that hadn't happened, it would have been catastrophic. It could have been, uh, you know, like Benoit in 66. Um, don't know that we ever got reprimanded for any of that. I don't recall that. Uh, I know that we had to recertify the next day and um, do a certification load, but that was just paperwork, basically. And then one other time, I was the cockpit guy. There was a cockpit guy on the weapons team. You always checked out the weapons system, and you had to check out the racks to make sure they all released. You had to uh, fire the guns dry to make sure that they would fire. But, I mean, you're just, all you're doing is triggering it, and it runs the, uh, the, the pin 
home and there's no munitions in there. And part of the process is one of the weapons team is looking up at the chute where the links all come out to see if there's any, you know, if the, if the gun barrel and breech is clear. Mm -hmm. um, and they would, yep, clear, clear, and then clear on the sec on the right wing, clear, both guns clear, and uh, the uh, crew chief would be out there, okay, clear, run the guns home, and they're all hydraulic, so you hear the hydraulics crank up, you'd uh, throw the right kind of switches, I don't remember what they were anymore in the cockpit, and you'd squeeze the trigger, and, and squeeze the trigger on the left guns, click, and they both ran home, okay, run the guns home on the uh, right side, click, boom! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, holy crap! And I, I, that seat still has this permanent saying in that pilot's seat, and it had fired off around. And one of the guys that had that responsibility on that right wing, either didn't look, didn't see, overlooked it. I don't know what happened. Uh, fortunately, that round just went across the runway, and who knows where it went, ended up. But we didn't get any repercussion on that as well. But those were. Two incidents that uh, happened. You were decertified. Oh well, we were decertified oh, again. Well. Yes, <laughs> but we but the certificate recertification process was okay. We're going to go out and watch you load another plane. Okay, you're good. That's so that it was pretty much a paper thing, and you there wasn't sounds, any training involved. It sounds like you had a different experience, Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had two planes taxi in front of me at night, and my crew chief decided that it was. We had one brass showing underneath the wing. After we had already loaded the plane with weapons. Oh. Okay. So he told me to go up in the cockpit and set the switches up and, and to bleed the line off so that the boat would move forward Run. on the, with the spring of it, you know. Run home. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it didn't move. And there's only one done it. <laughs> so uh, he says, uh, tap the trigger once. Well, I tapped the trigger and four rounds went out over oh. top of this plane. We were in a revetment. Oh. Do you have any idea what that sounded like? Oh, my gosh. So you had them all four go off at the same time? No, just one gun. One gun. Fired oh, four oh, shots. Four yeah, boom, boom, boom. and that's just by tapping the trigger. Oh, crap. Yeah, and uh, so one of the pilots that just came in, next thing I knew, he was on my wing right beside me and dared me to get out of the seat. And... Uh, so uh, I knew he had a weapon, so I wasn't about to question him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh. So uh, we were decertified on the spot, yep. and uh, we had to write up a report when all four of us had to write reports. And I put on mine that, uh, that the, uh, the gun firing by itself was probably a, uh, what do they call it? Um, Stray electricity. Mm -hmm, uh, An anomaly? Well, kind of like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he didn't like that idea. And uh, so, but I said, "Well, you're a pilot." I said, "How do you fire your guns?" He said, two at a time." And I said, "That's my point." <laughs> so uh, he, so we end up, uh, we had to go to another plane. We loaded a hard, you know, 500 pound bombs of hard bombs, and um, they recertified us. Oh yeah. Because we only had two load crews at night. Yeah. And we needed every person yeah. in order to have the six o'clock launches ready to go. Yeah, so they they didn't waste much time no. getting us back on the commission. No, recertification was go do so, a load and we'll watch you. The the certif certification team would watch you. Yeah. Yep, you're good. You're good. You're good. This was a, would be an experienced yeah. crew that because we had three squadrons as I remember it at the time, and there were about twenty planes per squadron. And there were just a few load crews, and uh, that's why we had the 12-hour shifts and no days off. And um, and then you mix in the SARS uh, that, you know, you had a plane loaded with hard bombs to go out over the trail and maybe some uh, napalm, and you had to pull all that off and upload it real quick for a SAR mission. And, um, and a, uh, there were a couple times that there were SAR missions that lasted longer than one day. Um, they were around the mm -hmm. clock um, during my tenure, and they, uh, the chow hall, they wouldn't even, if you, wouldn't, if you were going to catch a couple of minutes of disease, you did it in the weapons shop uh, or even under the wing of the plane. I remember laying there and taking a quick 15 minute nap, and they would bring the uh, chow out to mm -hmm. you in a bed of a uh, pickup truck and uh, for breakfast or lunch or dinner, and 
that's how you spent your 24, 48 hours uh, during a intense SAR. I was going to ask you, since I was the last guy there, did you have gun safety blocks for your guns? The the squeeze with the things that were, would fit up in there so the bolt wouldn't close? You know, I don't remember that. Maybe that was probably part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I think that may have been a result from, of. From experience, you know, because yeah. one of the first things I had to do was that was we worked on any guns we we had to put those in. They were already in. Yeah. Okay. But that still didn't happen. There probably that, was a that, sa there probably had to be a safety mechanism, but yeah. but part of the and part of the weapons crew responsibility before you put a load on a plane mm -hmm. was to make sure that all the load oh, all oh, the okay. yeah. all the pylons work properly, uh, that they release properly, and the guns uh, would run home, and you'd hit the trigger to run the bolts home one yeah. time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did, I did a lot of that. Uh, that was naked guns. I mean, we didn't have any on it. We were changing guns. But we, even with the safety blocks, we had guys that had that little accident that happened to. And really? With a safety block even there? No. Oh. No safety block. Oh, it, no safety. There were three other ones, but uh, oh, that they, was they the forgot end. to put it in. Yeah. Okay. And that, that would get a CH3 or a CH53 going seven miles west of town to see what, oh. what water buffalo got hit. Or oh, it was... <laughs> It was not. Uh, I never had any reports about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> That'd go a long way. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. a lot of yeah. a lot of powder. Well, as, yeah. as a nineteen-year-old, you know you're dumb and you're stupid and you do silly things, mm -hmm. but you you mix that with these dangerous weapons, yeah. and uh, that's not a good recipe right. for safety. Um, but you had a crew chief that was experienced. We had a, yep. a four striper. Uh, e5 that uh, was on his second tour, but he came from a, uh, a sack base um, And he was okay, but, but he had three one stripers that he was trying to train and Because there was no there was no weapons training at all on learn you learned on the job yeah. at NKP when I got to NKP it was all learning on the job yeah. other than doing your 3-0 book work and then eventually your 5-0 book work well, even at Hurlburt, we never put a weapon on a plane. Right, but we never studied yeah. even what they were. Yeah. And you just yeah. learned yeah. in the right. process of uh, doing. Um, and typically, they put you, the way the on-the-job training was, they give you two weeks, you're on the job, you're mirroring a, one of the guys on an experienced load team, and they're going back home in about three or four weeks. Um, so it was, uh, it was under fire, so to yeah. speak. So, you know, 19-year-old kids do stupid things either intentionally or unintentionally. And one of the things we did intentionally, napalms were always curious to us. And sitting on a trailer, um, was, what is that stuff really like? So there's, a, there's an access panel that you, you could... You talking about the napalm? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's like jail. I know. Well, we found, we found that out. Mm -hmm. So we'd, we'd, I don't remember if it was a screw or a turnkey or something, you could lift that panel off. You reach your hand down in, and it comes out with a this pinkish glue kind of stuff on it. Yep. So the one guy, my buddy, Art Mulherin, he says, hey, let's see if that'll really ignite. <laughs> so we took a, a coffee cup, and a, a, I don't know, styrofoam or cardboard or whatever, put a half a scoop in there and set it off over the, by the clong, and somebody had a match or something, hit that, threw it at that thing, and a <laughs> little... Flame popped up, and we thought, that's pretty cool. So 19-year-old kids do stupid things. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, so that recollection of those a couple of instances um, with the flare and the, and the gun, I don't, I'm presuming they were all unintentional, but I couldn't swear that they were unintentional. I mean, it would be silly to not be unintentional, but uh, it's just, you know, it's a recipe for um, um, for having uh, issues mm -hmm. uh, when you put a bunch of 19-year-old kids fresh out of tech school because the whole, most of our crew, all of our crew came right over from tech school at different times and most of the other couple of loads crews were all right out of tech school and, and didn't have experience at a local uh, based on some of their aircraft before coming there. Yeah, when they, they needed uh, them badly. In uh, October of '68, they uh, trained me into being a uh, load crew leader, hmm. and uh, in doing so, um, later on, 
I had to certify the, I don't know what happened to the certifying officer, but uh, I had to do certification loads on people coming from uh, Natrang to help fill in where some of the people were leaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a, a kind of a strange thing. Me and another fellow uh, that extended over there, and uh, we were both selected for load chiefs at the time. So that was a, uh, but the napalm, I had a question for you, is that we had clay pots that screwed into the, the front, nose. White phosphorus. Okay. Now, I was looking at a plane uh, picture that, um, I don't know if it was John Larson put on there or who, but it looked like it had a arming wire going on one. Well, the, the, the white phosphorus was a pot that screwed into the nose or the, and the tail mm -hmm. of the plane, mm -hmm. and then a fuse went into that clay, okay. screwed into the clay well, pot. Well, see, we never used a fuse. Oh, you didn't? The, oh, okay. the fuse we was did. the clay pot itself. Oh. And that's what I, I kept seeing that well, on the, there. And I looked at that picture and I thought, what in the world is that stuff? You know, what did they do there? You know? Hmm. Well, something and, had to ignite. Maybe the impact ignited well, the that white phosphorus. Well, the, white, the white phosphorus pot uh, was only clay. Yeah. Uh, and it was thin. Yes, it was. And if you had a crack uh, starting to form in it, you better get rid of that thing. Mm. So we had water bucket, 55-gallon uh, yep. mm. drums. Yep, they did have it there. And uh, we'd drop it in there. If and you needed to. That was to. the EOD's thing from there, you know. Yeah. So. Well, our, and when we put those white phosphorus in the nose or the tail of the 500 or the 750 napalms, there was also a fuse. I th it, I don't know if it was different than what we used in the hard bomb or not, but I do remember a fuse with the vein. Wait a minute. Maybe there wasn't a fuse with the vein because they had a nose cap on it. Um, so I'm, I may be imagining yeah. something, but we put uh, maybe, no, we put the nose cap on for streamlining. Yeah, right. And protect right. that bond, that um, pot from being mm -hmm. busted by a bird or something in the air. You right. Know? Right. That's all makes sense to me now because Tom Dwelly was telling me how they would use a napalm canister and they'd put cameras in it. And I was like, how would you cut and get a camera in the nose or the tail of this thing? But if there was a nose cone that went on where that yeah. was, that would be easy to put a yeah. lens or something over that. Yeah. 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 The tail, we didn't normally put a cone on. No. But it's just the front. It had, it had yeah. fins on it, though. Yeah. No, not mine. Yours didn't have fins on it? We never no. had a fin. They right. came from the bomb dump already with the fins on. Um, and we could have gotten without fins. I just remember fins, and um, but you never. And the the white phosphorus things that you're talking, clay pots that you're talking about, those came in a can, and you had a it was like a coffee can. Yep. You had to had to turn well, the key around. Well, it. that's different than what we had. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. We, we had the six of them would come in a uh, thing, and it was real cushioned like an egg carton. Oh. And it was, you know, and it kind of molded. See, forward. they modernized as they come. I don't know. <laughs> left right but they, they were six at a time. Man. Yeah. Ours were in a can because I remember cutting my, matter of fact, I still got the the scar cutting it on the can when I was opening it with a, it was like uh, when you open a coffee can, the old fashioned coffee yeah. cans with a can. With well, the now, well, speaking of that, the 20 pounders, the 20 pound bombs, the, the cluster bombs, Yeah. you had to open each one of those cans separately. Hmm. And, and uh, we got to where we got tired of using the, the key. 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 Just take the We'd just take pliers, pliers and pull it off, <laughs> and yeah. Yank it, yep. and you got a good chance of getting cut that way, but yep. uh, it was a lot quicker. Well, our, our, uh, it took forever to do 144 of them things. Our cluster bombs already came to us on the trailer. There were six to the cluster, three in the front cluster, three in the back cluster, two up here, one down below. And they just basically took that whole, whatever it was, 120 pounds worth and shoved it up into the uh, pylon yeah. rack. To yeah, we had to carry them things. We didn't, no. uh, uh, it wasn't no fun. No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, some people says no joy. <laughs> yeah, there was no joy in that load. No. <laughs> no. I, want, I want to tell you a little, go back to guns for a little bit. Yeah. Because we, you know, we, we, we played around too. But I don't know if you remember, many guns used to jam occasionally yeah mm -hmm. and they, they'd call us to come down you know clear them at the end of the runway well there was no real order how, how what to do we knew how to rebuild, rebuild them 
And we came to find out what the easiest thing is to pull the pins and pull the feeder right off of it. Yeah. Well, if the round was damaged enough, it would be bent holding that thing on there. So you'd oh, have crap. to reef that thing and, you know, powder come out of the little, little rounds. That wasn't bad. Never had anyone fire. So I took this minigun to the shop. I don't even think I was working in a minigun shop. I think it just had me on there helping them. And I got these two broken rounds, you know, and I'm, mm -hmm. percussion prime, you know, well, I pulled, the, I pulled the projectile out of it and I stuck it in a vise and I got a center punch and a hammer and pop, you know. Oh, that's pretty cool, you know, this is, this is in the afternoon. <laughs> that night, we had to clear an inboard gun on an A1. Round was all torn up. Hey, let's, let's see what this is. Do the same does. thing. Do the same thing. <laughs> Took the round out. Put it in there, and pot, the powder was out. Yeah. But that primer, and it was about two thirty in the morning, and I hit the. Was like, the primer? And we, yeah. Boom. And, and our, we were moved in the new gun shop, which was metal building. And a hangar. Oh. Yeah. And, oh. and Captain Carvelli, I think, was on duty that night. He came flying out. Of, he was sound asleep. He came flying. <laughs> he took the security police about two seconds to get there. What the hell's going? On? Oh yeah, you know, I, you know, we're okay, we're okay, okay. I, you know, I hit this round over here. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sweating. I'm figuring, like you guys, you know, I'm, here goes my stripes. <laughs> yeah. But it was so loud. I well, mean, <laughs> back to my statement: nineteen and twenty-year-old kids yep. Yep. that uh, do stupid Quasi stuff. Quasi supervised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Quit inquisitive did. little boogers. Yeah. Um, yep, you were, we were inquisitive, yeah. there's no doubt about it. But when you're working 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, um, that was your quote-unquote fun, uh, so to speak. So, uh, yeah. yeah, yep, it was... I asked uh, everybody this, would you go back and do it again? How soon? All right. Yeah. Are we leaving this afternoon? I'm good. <laughs> yeah. no. you... you know, when I was there, absolutely not. I don't yeah. want any part of this. Matter of fact, when I came back, and I don't know if what your guys' experiences were like, we flew into um, um, oh, what were the Air Force Travis. Base? Travis, mm -hmm. flew into Travis, got off, kissed the ground, and um, had my 1505s, a uh, tan, whatever they call them, 1505s on at the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'd already made plans to, uh, with two other guys to take a taxi because we didn't want to take the bus. It was going to take too long to get to the airport. And I knew my flight connection to get back home was going to be tight, and I didn't want to have to wait to a later flight. So we took the taxi, got off, and I, uh, um, they let me off at my terminal by myself, got my, oh, what do they call it, the duffel bag, mm -hmm. and uh, started walking across to get into the terminal, and you had to run the gauntlet of the protesters. And... Um, some of the guys were told not to wear their uniforms. And, exactly. But they, they, I don't know whether they didn't tell us, tell me or tell, or I, that story didn't reach me, or if it did, I probably would have said, screw you guys, I'm going to wear it anyway. And um, um, had uh, just jeers and yelling and screaming, and uh, one guy spit on me, so I dropped my duffel bag real quick and started running after him. And, the rest of the crowd just kind of jumped in front of him, and you had to make your way through him. And uh, the one guy, uh, the, uh, an army guy, yelled back, "It's not worth it, man. Just come on." So I left, left it uh, be, and picked up my duffel bag and went indoors. And that was my first acquaintance with the uh, welcome home ceremony that a lot of GIs received. And um, I am so thankful that the American public have changed their attitude completely during uh, the Middle East conflicts and how they have embraced, uh, even though they didn't agree with the conflict, mm -hmm. but they've embraced the veterans. Right. And back then, the veterans were the enemies. The guys mm -hmm. that were coming back were the enemies. They were the baby killers. And it was... Uh, so I, I, that had left me such an impression in my flight home. I can distinctly remember playing that event over my mind. Why are they doing this? Why? I don't understand this. And Because you're shielded from all that. You don't mm -hmm. see that news. You don't see the newspaper clippings and articles and, the, and what have you. And it really left a huge sour taste in my mouth. I, uh, so when I got to my next assignment, which was my last assignment, George Air Force Base, I was there two and a quarter, two and a half years, something like that. 
and made minimum ta- grade, and I've ta- given the story about reenlistment, and I wasn't going to do that. When I got out, I got rid of everything military-wise, completely, com- thoroughly. I was disgusted. You know, I was sick that we lost, you know, 50,000 guys, and people back home were reacting this way, way and I thought, this is just a flippin' joke. So I got rid of all my military stuff, and I really... Um, I left that in the rearview mirror for a long time until my wife, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so ago, you know, every once in a while I'll talk about NACOM phenomenon. I always wanted to find my buddy, Art Mulheron, and I'd search on the internet for him and never could find him. And she found the NACOM phenom Facebook page. She said, hey, you got to join this. I thought, I don't want to relive those memories. Well, fortunately... I listened to her, regrettably, um, and I joined that page. I don't know how long it's been now, maybe eight or ten years. And, um, and then I joined several other veterans pages uh, after that as well. And I'm very thankful that I did. And the biggest regrets that I have, one, I didn't keep a daily log or journal of stuff that I did or the impacts or impressions that I had. Um, and I didn't keep any of my uniforms. I had, I had some even 20, 20 millimeter uh, blue tipped rounds that were dummy yeah. rounds in, in links. Uh, so I, I had several memorabilia things like that that I just chucked. It all went, but I'm, so I regret that. But you can't bring back regrets, but you can do what you can do today and move forward and, uh, um, this is my first Sky Raider reunion. I'm thankful I found SpadNet and mm-hmm. started joining, and I'm glad that uh, some of those guys encouraged, uh, you know, ground troops to participate and come. And and my one of my motivations for coming is to meet some of the pilots that were stationed there: George Merritt, uh, Don Dunaway, Wayne uh, Warner, um, Jim Beggarly. I've met previously. And, a, and Jim George and a few others that were there at exactly the same time frame. And I've read uh, the first book I picked up about the same time that she encouraged me to get on the uh, Facebook site was George Merritt's book. Mm-hmm. And I read that. And um, it evoked a lot of memories good and bad, Um, and I started seeing names. I said, I remember that. Captain Dunaway, Lieutenant Beggarly, Major Hall, you know, these guys, I knew their names, didn't know them, obviously, but to us, 19-year-old kids, the pilots were our heroes. You know, Mm -hmm. they were the guys that were putting their butts on the line every day. They were the guys that were significantly with a chance of not coming back. And each time we would lose one, I remember that it was extremely sad for us, particularly if we had loaded that plane. Um, I don't remember those planes that I loaded any longer, but if I'd kept a journal, I I would have. Uh, But no doubt, uh, some of those planes I likely would have loaded, um, and it would have been their last load to send them off. So I'm glad I found uh, the Nikon Phenom Facebook page. I'm glad that I found the Sky Raider group. And um, my goal this uh, couple of days is to meet each one of them, thank them for the time that we spent or didn't really spend together. But I also want to get a group photo eventually of those that were there the same time frame that I was. So A great way for that. Is it Saturday night's dinner? Mm-hmm. Yep, mm-hmm. I figured that. Dressed and you oh yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I figured there, I figured there'd be opportunity. Plus, yeah. I want to yeah. have each of the guys that wrote a book that I read their books uh, get a chance to autograph it or sign it. So that'll be a memento that I'll keep and I'll make sure that my grandchildren keep. Great. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you guys want to close with, Barry or Paul? Well, I agree with him about the sadness that uh, comes in when you lose a, a pilot. Uh, Especially when we lost uh, Colonel Ford, first organized the 6th. And uh, he would come out every morning and 
be around us talking with us while we're trying to sort out what parts go on the plane, you know, uh, to get it ready to go to be shipped to the West Coast where it was going to be uh, ferried on a boat or some way to get it to Vietnam. And uh, we got to know him as an officer uh, pretty well. And most times officers are not people you ever get to know much about. And so with him, it got to be where we was not only respected him, but we appreciated him. And um, then after we got to Vietnam, I got to know uh, Major Johns. And Major Johns was, I called him Howdy Doody. I mean, not to him, but <laughs> that's what he looked like to me. You know, he has the big ears and thin and, and a very pleasant personality and, and uh, liked this, uh, the joke. And he'd come out to the cruise out there while we were working and talk to us while we were out there working. Both of those guys died tragic. Uh, and uh, the I didn't want to learn the names of any more pilots after that because uh, it hurts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Still does today. Yep. <clears throat> but... Uh, I wonder, what, did you guys have any get under any rocket attacks or over there? There was only one time <laughs> that uh, I remember we were sent, I was working a day shift, but it was nighttime, I was sleeping, and the horns went off, and we uh, jumped up, and they had helmets for you, they had gas masks for you, and some other kind of pack. And um, the drill was that you assembled outside your barracks at the in, in between the H-shaped barracks. There was a um, a bomb a bunker sand bunker sand bunker, but it was out of out of ammo boxes or something. <coughs> and everybody, you generally didn't go in there because you're afraid of snakes. king cobras and yep. snakes in there. <laughs> so. Uh, the drill was if, if that went off, you were supposed to get assemble and get into the bunker. It went off. We went up and here the uh, helicopters or the C-123s were dropping flares on the one perimeter. And you could hear some crack, 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 crack off in the distance. And you thought, oh, crap, there's gunfire going on. And they said, and I remember the um, arms guy came around um, with the uh, M-16s and handed them out. And but didn't give us any ammo, fortunately. And said, uh, We said, Why aren't you giving us ammo? And they said, Well, we'll, we'll be back if you need it. I'm like, Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a rocket attack, but it was a sapper attack. And they were, mm -hmm. they were trying to test the perimeters of the base yeah. uh, occasionally yeah. that that would happen, but never, yeah. never a rocket attack that yeah. I can recall anyway. Yeah. Well, the uh, rockets, uh, they had 13 and a half pounds of high explosive in the warhead. And it could carry gas as well, and uh, nerve gas or even tear gas. But the, uh, those things, when they would hit the ground, it would put out quite a blast. And uh, there was one rocket that come in, and me and Virgil House was trying to make up our mind, are we going to the bunker or not? <laughs> and we were standing at the doorway. I had no flak vest on or anything, and it was at night. And we just got to the door trying to figure out where it was going to open it because those rockets were landing behind us not too far away, you know. And we threw the door open, and when it did, there's a rocket went and hit. Uh, it was a storage dump there for tar barrels. And it hit the tar barrels, and it erupted them. They were just throwing them up in the air. And the blast knocked me into Virgil as we were going. There was a staircasing to the second floor. I run him into the second, uh, the staircasing, and like to broke his arm, I think. But we dove into the bunker. And when we got to the bunker, somebody had a flashlight and had a gun. I didn't know anybody had a gun because nobody in the barracks had guns. But somebody was there had a gun. I was sure hoping it wasn't in North Vietnamese. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so I went home for a 30-day leave um, in between my extension. And I'd given my, my uh, I'd bought a car that was wrecked, and my brother was fixing it up for me. 
and we were walking through the uh, the garage that was in, and he was pointing out this and that about the car, and a plane went through the sound barrier. I was on the ground. I mean, flat out on the ground, and I was waiting for the second one to come in, and then I realized that was Blaine talking. My brother was talking as he was. He didn't even know I just dove to the ground. <laughs> but I, I found that to be a problem for a while, um, especially when somebody set off some firecrackers behind me and I wasn't expecting it. You know, uh, so uh, I'm sure that um, a lot of the guys that was with me uh, probably experienced the same kind of problems. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that's big right now, but uh, it sure was for a while. Well. My wife can tell you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had a few instances like Arnie had, a, they, they either sent a 123 up with flares, and then we had gunships when I was there, the C-119s. Oh, yeah. And they would circle. I, I never really heard them fire anything, but you'd see a lot of pin flares oh, and stuff going oh, on. Oh, well, we had... Uh, my, my, my third night at Da Nang was July 5th, from coming over from NKP, and they had we had like 74 rockets hit, oh, wow. and uh, hit a 130. And uh, I've got a picture of our. I don't know if it was my barracks. I had moved twice, but I came back from date when it daylight hit, and here was a dud 122 that went through the concrete footer, and oh. didn't explode. Oh crap! And my picture has the nasty word written above it. Blanked out, thank goodness. <laughs> and then the gun shop I worked in was made out of plywood and junk, whatever you could make up. And it has the part of a 122 that didn't go off, but the metal was unwound uh, through the wall. Hmm. But uh, that July 5th, uh, I think eight guys got killed. It hit the all the barracks over, I think, where the, tw the 20th tasks were. A lot of enlisted guys were killed. Hmm. And... Uh, I mean, we had rocket attacks like once a week for, mm -hmm. for a long time. The fuel truck got hit, one of the big fuel trucks, and oh, sat yes. there and burned. And I, I, you know, I, you, you never got used to it. That was no. the thing. I mean, and then when they did come in and you were out on the flight line, okay, here's the bomb, you know, F-4, full fuel, napalm, bombs, under, where, do you, where do you go? You know, the, the bunkers are over here. So you'd, you'd crawl in, because they always came from the west, we'd get up against the retaining wall and get as low as we could, because they would come in and they would arc, and they hit the concrete shells over the build over the airplanes. Yeah, it took a while. I went back to college, and it was the same thing, guy going over, driving over a manhole with a, you know, boom, boom. rattle a manhole. Mm -hmm. it, it, it'd get to you. And, but I, I did want to reiterate what, what Arnie didn't get a good welcome. Welcome home. I came home after the two years, and I finally got to go home. So I pulled my 1505s out of the locker, oh, yeah. and I pulled them up. I gained 10 pounds, and as soon as I pulled them up for the belt loops, he just ripped the plate. They were <laughs> rotten. They sure rotten. everything was rotten. Yeah. So I bought a new pair of 1505s, and I have a picture of me standing in Yokota, Japan, coming back, and I got back on the plane, and this officer comes up to me, and says. He looked at me and says, I'm not going to say anything, but did the, the, they change the way you put your metal ribbons and stuff on your form? And I had my some U.S. stuff that I think went on your blues on yeah. my collars. I, oh. get, I was getting saluted. <laughs> and, and he goes, yeah, you ought you to you take those get off. Get the U.S. <laughs> emblems. Those are for your blues. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I got the Travis, and I, 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 you know, made it to the airport and uh, sitting, you know, on the back of the bus and... Uh, right before we took off, the a stewardess came back and she said, uh, Miss, come up, come up front. Uh oh, I said, something's, something's wrong here. And so I followed her up and she says, because uh, duffel bag, I didn't even carry on baggage. And uh, met this guy coming back. And he, he didn't say anything. And I followed her up there in first class. So this is your seat. So wow. I had to fly from Travis to, well, from San Francisco to El Paso to Lubbock to Amarillo, and then my parents picked me up about 4 o'clock in the morning. I was so slouched. <laughs> I was so, you know, but nobody, I mean, that was a, a, an act of kindness. And, of course, I, you know, I, I live in the Midwest, so, and, but uh, when I went back to college, uh, we had the Vietnam veterans on campus, 
and it was good or bad. We had, you know, we could bond. We, you know, we told we weren't going to tell war stories. We're just going to sit here. We had guys like Bob Dole come in and talk to us and really nice and stuff. But there was such a coldness from the rest of the campus. If they mm -hmm. you were a vet, you, I mean, and this was Kansas too. They, you just, Man, you, you, you didn't you, want to admit you, you were a veteran. You, you, you didn't want to admit it. You know? yeah. you didn't and know. I like I, 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 uh, I took lots of pictures, lots of slides, and I brought them home. But like Arnie, I, I didn't do anything until I got on Facebook, and then met guys like him at the reunion and a few of the officers. And Years ago, I was in uh, sales for a company, and, and we did a lot. Uh, it was one of Dolly Parton's dinner shows, and I worked with the military, and, mm -hmm. and it was always the World War II guys. And at that time, and they went through, they didn't go through the anger that you went through, mm -hmm. but they didn't start talking or meeting for 20 years mm -hmm. after World War II. Yeah. And I think you guys are about in this, you're probably 40 years now yeah. in that same cycle where you're starting to reconnect. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad to see that because, you know, um, and, and, I, and I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of pilots, a lot of military guys. I wasn't in the military, so I see the world outside of the military where people don't have that bond and they don't have that camaraderie. Mm -hmm. They don't have that respect for one another. Mm -hmm. You can see two veterans walk up to each other. They don't know each other at all, man. Mm -hmm. And they would, they would hug each That's other. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I am so glad to see you guys coming together. And this morning when we got together, uh, I know you two fellas knew each other, but Paul, I said, hey, Paul, you want to hop in with us? And, well, heck yeah, <laughs> yeah. let's That's go, great. you know? Yeah. And, and I'm yeah. so glad that you took the time to share your stories here. Um, and, and it does, it comes full circle of what happened on those bases. You know, everybody hears about the pilot and what they did in there, but to, to know what it took to keep everything running, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. insurmountable. And, uh, and like you were saying, Arnie, 19 year old kids learning <laughs> yeah. on the fly, yep. it's amazing. Uh, that we didn't kill each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we were fortunate in one way. Mm -hmm. We got to see what a great bunch of guys we worked with. Mm -hmm. And we did have people that cared about us. And I, did you get to a Bob Hope show? Oh, no. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, we took it. one rocket the night before and they wouldn't let him land. Oh. Yeah. And Arnie saw a, a good one in yep. uh, NKP and yep. I got him in 71. Yep. Oh, good. And, and an Ann Margaret show. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mamie Van Doren. Don't the White Owl. Nope. Can't go wrong if Ann Margaret shows up. <laughs> <No, yeah. laughs> She's still a yeah. great looking yeah. woman. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I got, I, go ahead, then. Well, I, got, I got to meet Richard Petty. Oh, wow. And Don Garlitz. And, uh, oh, my. A, a guy from Ohio, Butch Hartman, was oh. a sprint car racer. Oh. And Don Garlitz was bringing his model of his first rear engine dragster. He brought really? it with him. And I got a picture of Petty. Without his cowboy hat and without his sunglasses. Oh my goodness! And I got him an autograph. You still have that? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I got the picture autographed. I got the, the I got the picture autographed after I came back because I live in Mooresville and that's where his shop was. So. Wow! But there there were people like that. There a lot of smaller USOs. I mean, uh, Roy Acuff yeah. came, and uh, I don't I don't know who you saw, but we we, we, we only had the uh, the year I was there. Uh, Bob Hope came in December of '68. I remember I was working. Um, uh, night shift at the time, and I got off at 6 o'clock, went to the chow hall. The show was going to happen, if I remember right, like about 3 o'clock in the afternoon at an outdoor amphitheater, and there's still there's video clips of it mm -hmm. that I've seen it mm -hmm. from that particular time frame. Can't see me, but I, uh, after chow hall, I was done probably 6.30, 7 o'clock, I went immediately, and I had my camera, got my camera, went immediately to the uh, bench, I was already in the seventh row on the right-hand <laughs> side back. And I uh, sat there for that time until the show started and because it was worth getting to see American people mm -hmm. entertaining you. And uh, you'd heard about the Bob Hope shows, but you didn't get to experience them. Mm -hmm. He bought, brought the gold diggers, mm -hmm. and I don't remember who else was in the troupe anymore, but... Uh, didn't meet anybody, but then Anne Margaret came some months later and did her own show, and same thing, got off at 6 o'clock in the morning, boom, right <laughs> right there to, for the 3 o'clock show later that day, and uh, um, 
You, know? you waited, you know, you waited all these months to see a round-eyed girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> and a movie star to, uh, yeah. to boot. So it was a, it was a great, great experience. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for sitting down. Is there anything else you'd like to cover while we're here, while the cameras are rolling? Uh, the only thing I'd add to it is my buddy Art Mulher, and I did finally connect with him yeah. uh, through the Facebook page, and I said, Art, is this really you? And we connected. We've seen each other now three times. Um, Art's story is he was a 462. We were on the same weapons load team. We got there and left about the same time. Or no, I left... We were going to leave about the same time, and two weeks before I was ready to leave, he said, I'm not leaving. I said, what do you mean you're not leaving? He said, I'm staying. He had met a girl downtown, and um, he said, I'm, I'm staying. I've uh, volunteered to stay here for another tour, another year. I said, are you nuts? No, man, I'm going to do it. So I found out later he stayed that year, six months more, and then he did another year at Udorn uh, on F4s, um, and he was a, an enlisted guy or that uh, made, what, what's the top rank, E9? Something yeah, like E9. That. E9. E9. That was the chief. Yeah. chief, yep. chief he, he, he made E9, uh, retired from the military at 22 or 28 years, and then he went to work for the Department of Defense, and he's working for them even as we speak. At this age, doing a very similar job, but he's maintaining guns on uh, gunships and, um, and ground uh, gunships on the, or gu gun on vehicles that are in Wyoming and they guard um, um, whenever they change out missile warheads. Mm -hmm. So his, his, he's still doing that job. Jeez. And he, married, he, married, he didn't marry that girl, but he married another girl that he met. Beautiful lady and just a uh, great story. I tried to talk him into coming here and trying to talk, talk him into coming to the NKP reunion. Don't know if he'll Keep trying. That. Oh, yeah, absolutely will. Yep, yeah. we'll, 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 we haven't given up yet. Yeah. So Never give uh, up. Made that yeah. connection. Yeah. You know, the Internet is fantastic for that, and I, I can't tell you how many people. That's actually how I got involved. There was one guy trying to search for another guy, and then, it came down the line, and Don Engelbretson with Ula. Yeah. Next thing I know, I'm in all this, and how did you get here? It's this. Yeah. Th it, it's a web, and mm -hmm. you know, it started with one guy looking for another guy, and yep. we've all kind of gathered into this small yep. family. And yep. it, it, it's yep. a wonderful experience. It is. I, I think one of the wonderful things about NKP is it was such a small base. It was. There, was, I mean, you can interrelate almost. From the start, Jim Burns is going to speak, and from, yep. he was there in 1962. TDY from the Philippines. No runway. I mean, it was dirt. The, the Navy was building it, and they, they they flew these helicopters for rescue. They, could, they had a range of seventy miles, huh. so they couldn't get anywhere. Yeah. So he, well, you know, a little we're going to add protection too. We hung a Browning rifle on, on a rope, and they put a fifty-five gallon drum of fuel, and they would go out, go as far as they could, plant that barrel, and go back, and then start taking fuel, and then they could extend themselves out. He's got a mm. terrific story. That's, mm. uh, I'll have to look that one up. Yeah. Yeah. Come to the reunion, you'll hear it live. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. I, I can't pull two this close together. <laughs> You're coming up in November, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Oh, gosh. Yeah. 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 I looked at Missy last night when you said that because we'd gone down there on vacation and we both fell in love with the area and she's like, fresh shrimp? I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it, we can do it. Yeah. Yeah, we could get fresh shrimp at China Beach. Did you ever get there? Oh, God. No. No? No. The fact is, uh, at China Beach, I got there one time. We had one down day out of 90 days, and we went to the beach. My, my team went and buried me in the sand. <laughs> and, that's a, and also, we went out, and there was a, a, a floating, um, like a buoy like, yeah. out there. Yeah. And you could climb on it. And we were starting to take bets on how deep that water was because it's so so clear mm -hmm. and uh, we got to the betting on who could touch the bottom and bring sand back if you didn't bring that sand back that wasn't good you know so I got down there and got a hold of the sand 
and pushed off to come back up. And I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the top. <laughs> <laughs> and I got up there, and there's about 10 grams of sand. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, I learned the body surf there, and that's how I lost all the hair on my chest. Oh, sure. <laughs> Again, fellas, thank you so much. Welcome. I really appreciate the time. And thanks for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for doing it. Yep. I looked over yonder and what did I see? A big green giant coming after me. He was born one morning in the sky. Here down the valley, so much Thank you.